everybody, welcome back. Welcome to another episode of Tell Me More with me, Tony Moore. Uh, hopefully, you guys tuned in to my chat with Sh- with Shangela from RuPaul's Drag Race. And now, I am super excited to chit-chat with my friend, Andrew Perosi, uh, who can be seen on uh, Disney's Frozen. He plays Finn, so you never really see him, but it's him. Um, but we're going to talk about Broadway, we're going to talk about him, um, and it's going to be a great conversation, so stick around. Let me add him. Hope everyone is doing well and remaining safe. And if you are a lover of theater, this is going to be great. Oh, look, there he is. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I love that you have on a very Rapunzel-esque braid. Thank you. This was, uh, I have been dared by my daughters to wear this all day. They said it had to be a wig. And luckily, eh, we didn't have any wigs available, so this is what I got stuck with. (laughs) This is what happens when you are on daddy duty 24 hours while we all are in quarantine. (laughs) Quarantine life, right? (laughs) Andrew, how are you? I'm well. I feel like, yeah, how am I? I don't know. I'm I'm well. (laughs) Well, I, yeah. (laughs) Well, being well is good because some people have already started unraveling so i'm glad that you're doing well i am trying not to unravel just like this braid just like keeping it together (laughs) all the colors unraveled into one uh no i feel um i i don't know i'm i'm curious to know how everyone is doing actually how is everyone (laughs) well me i'm doing fine like i keep telling people this is the staycation that I have been asking for. So like, I'm at home, I got my Netflix, my Hulu, I got uh, my cable, I got food, I'm doing this, like, I'm doing great. Oh. There we go, turn my thing on silent. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to me too sometimes, like I keep seeing up here, like someone will call in and I'm like, oh, no, sorry, she's busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so let's chit chat. Uh, first off, I want people to know more about you because you are super talented. Like I've known of you for years, and I have had the blessing of seeing you on Broadway. Um, in my favorite musical, Frozen. Like I love Frozen. Like if I could play Elsa, I totally would. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's every little girl's dream, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. So um, you're a singer, actor, dancer. Like, when did you discover your talent? Because I remember when I discovered mine, but I'm always curious when other people discover theirs. Um, a, I love this question. And B, for me, it actually happened really young. I was... Yeah. Uh, I was four when I first started taking dance class, so that was a little too young for me to be like, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But but in starting that young and then also playing piano and, and I was in, on the soccer team, I was doing like Boy Scouts, every, every activity that I could get involved in, I wanted to do. So yeah. by the time I was eight, you know, being pulled in all these directions, mm-hmm. I had also started doing ballet more uh, like professionally training. Yeah. And at eight years old was kind of the moment it clicked where I was like, oh, all of it takes time, but I really love dancing. So I stuck with dance and I, and it, it led me into like being able to perform in the Nutcracker mm-hmm. and starting out, even at a young age to be on stage and to feel the thrill of like telling a story, hearing the, the response from an audience. Yeah. And um, there was no sugar rush that I could get from any candy that would fill that kind of <laughs> void in me as a kid. And I think that was like, well, I know what I'm going to do for my life. Who, who put you in, in dance class? Because like, I know when I was growing up, I discovered my love of dance very young, but I had family members that told me because I was a guy that like, I shouldn't be dancing and they made me stop. But I'm glad to hear that someone obviously put you in in class who, who encouraged you to, to do that. That would be me madre. Oh, you got to love me. I know. Thank goodness for moms. Um, and actually, I grew up in a like a single mother household, but we also lived with my grandparents. Mm-hmm. So really, it was sort of like a trio of adulting going on there with my mom, 
my grandmother and my grandfather and they would sort of juggle me like a ball okay who can take him to dance okay who can take him to football okay who can take him and they just having that family around the yeah. support system is the reason that i was able to even pursue my dreams in, yeah. in especially uh, especially in such a way that uh now i'm reading some of these comments sorry that's funny <laughs> This was a dare from my daughter. <laughs> it all really stemmed from my mom. She pushed me to dance class and said, just go try it. Um, and I think her eagerness for me to, to try any and everything is mm -hmm. also why I was ambitious enough to try everything. Yeah, which is good, because I, I feel like when you do have people that support what you're doing and, like, encourage you, um, it's that much better. Like, my, I, I would talk to my mom, because my mom, you know, knew that at a very young age that I was going to be an entertainer um, in some form of fashion. And um, I used to always tell her that I wish that someone did put me in dance class, someone did put me in acting class, because um, it was, not that it was forbidden, but, like, I was discouraged because when I discovered dance, I discovered it around like my, my aunts who, um, and I was living in Alabama, no shade to Alabama, but um, it was kind of like, no, you know, guys are not supposed to dance. Like this is, you know, a gross thing. Um, and I didn't rediscover my love of dance until I was a junior in high school. Um, so I wish that, you know, at a younger age I had found it because you know, who knows? No, you got to put it back on. Don't disappoint them. Um, <laughs> but I wish that I had, like, I had that encouragement because I always say, who knows what path it could have led down if I had kept going at a younger age. See, and I talk about just the difference of that privilege. Like, yeah. and I, I just want to call it out, being the person on this side of it, where I had that privilege to pursue it, no matter how tight times got with money, no matter how much people couldn't have, you know, didn't have the time to drive me and I had to take, you know, like it wasn't like I had a, a chauffeur or that sort of privilege, but just privilege in a different way where I had a community that actually saw a male pursuing dance yeah. as a good thing or as a positive thing, as an opportunistic moment mm -hmm. rather than uh, like, you know, I, I just think it's... Um, I don't know. It's it's the world that we grew up in, and it's the world that I think it, it becomes almost our responsibility to squash. Yeah. Especially me being on this side to say no, like, you know, I had this privilege, and I think every boy should have that privilege to be to be able to pursue whatever his dreams are, and for women, whatever their dreams are. As a young girl, because I I raised two little daughters, and yes. you know, seeing them look out into the world for me, I, I want them to understand that there are no limitations anymore. Yeah. We are that generation that watched our parents suffer and who instilled things upon us that caused us to sort of be limited by boxes and by charts and graphs. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, it's like, here's our one chance. Here is the pivot in the world and the shift that we want to keep seeing out there. Mm -hmm. We just make it in ourselves. Yeah. So as a parent, I know I like I have had such privileges with this current position that I'm in with Frozen, where I get to see children of all ages and all abilities and all types and all colors and all, all ethnicities come to our theater. And, 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 and I get to go to these festivals and to see them all know within themselves that there is an opportunity, a chance yeah. to become whatever it is that is like festering inside of them as that dream. Yeah. I just think that's this is the new way and like there's no going back. Yeah, because the arts are very inspiring. I still remember my first musical that I ever saw was Hello, Dolly. And I remember sitting in, like, the front row, and one of the dancers did, like, a high kick, and it kind of scared me, so I went, oh, like that. And she kind of smiled, um, and I remember seeing her backstage, and she, like, signed my little thing, like, you know, sorry I scared you doing that high kick. But I, I will never forget that moment of just being like, wow, people do this and it's live and it feels so great. And like, this is what I want to do. Um, do you remember your first like musical or production that you saw that kind of made you go, oh, my God, yeah, I want to do that. I want to be in that. 
Yes. Um, for me, I had been seeing a lot of musicals starting at a young age. So once again, another privilege I had living in New Jersey, going into New York. For me, musicals were like, you know, I mean, we were a we were a a family that were not we were above the poverty line, but it wasn't like we had all of this extra money. So when we yeah. got to go to Broadway shows, it was like a family thing, and yeah. maybe one to two a year. Yeah. And so because like we do, we try to get in Thanksgiving and then try to get in at um you know at like christmas and so it was always really just two times a year we could like the seeing a show was a like ritual and so for yeah. me i already had a lot of experience of seeing musicals so when i saw um bringing the noise bringing the funk mm -hmm. i saw for the first time like because as a as a tap dancer at my core for the yeah. first time i saw somebody take the like, the concept of musical and telling a story on on stage that way and shifting it to a whole new uh, like drive gear, like a gear shaft. Like it was like, this is so cool because we're communicating through movement, through sound, through, through, and we're telling historical, um, like historical situations that, that have affected the course of music. Yeah. You know, movement. I mean, not just tap, but like all styles of dance. And, and yeah. um, so that spoke to me uh, a lot. And then, and then it kind of shifted right when I was uh, 18, um, I saw Moving Out, no, 16. I was like 16 years old. I went and I saw Moving Out. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was also another one that I was like, oh, communicating, not just by like a park and bark, you know, and belting an entire song, but like communicating. So for me, it was it was sort of my love and passion for dance mm -hmm. that, that spun how musicals affected me. Yeah. Um, because I was always in awe I, like I remember when I saw um, uh, Phantom of the Opera for the first time, mm -hmm. and and uh, and he was singing, um, he was singing like "No more talk of darkness, forget these white eyes." And I just remember thinking to myself, like, this is epic. This is like a story. And I and now it's funny. My kids saw Phantom just to like fast forward real quick. Yeah, and I don't even think they really captured the story. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being at eight years old, thinking like, "Oh my God!" You know, he's haunting the the whole house, and and like I could specifically say every word uh, between Raúl and Christine. I just was yeah. I had it me like mem uh, memorized and on repeat on my little tape deck because, and maybe that's it, man. Maybe it's because we only had one tape. We didn't yeah. have you know Spotify this, Spotify that. Exactly. But I, look at I'm aging us. Oh no! Look, listen, I my favorite movie growing up was The Bodyguard, and for some reason I don't know why it was The Bodyguard, but you know it was Whitney Houston. Like, hello, I mean, anything Whitney, yeah. Yeah, and I remember recording The Bodyguard on a cassette tape so that way I could listen to it, and I knew that movie backwards and forwards. There were probably some things that I shouldn't know that I learned in that movie, but... At a young age, right? When you're yeah. like, hmm, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but we used to do that. We used to study and investigate. And yeah. I think that kind of... I just saw somebody comment here real quick. They said, what have your advice for dancers, artists that didn't discover their love and talent until they were older? But, like, that goes to what we were just saying about what we were talking about. Yeah. And, um, and it's interesting because I think now we give this opportunity to to you know kids of all all ages and, mm -hmm. and it, it's sort of it's accepted now into our community but um i think the other thing that we don't talk about is like ageism in our community yeah you know like somebody like me where i've had this beautiful opportunity to be in a a, a role on broadway which has been my dream by the way since i was eight years old yeah um i I look now and I think to myself, like, you know, there are some people who are finding this passion later in life, uh -huh. but because we're so, in we're encouraging everybody of all ages, I think that because we lean younger, we also kind of forget that, like, it's okay to, to be older and find your path, re-find your passion, re-figure yeah. out what it is you want to do. Yeah, and you're, <laughs> and you're never, yeah, and you're never too old to, to do that. Like, I, I feel like sometimes we tell ourselves, like, oh, no, I can't do that because I'm this age. And it's like, sometimes you never know. I, I read somewhere that someone was, like, in their 80s when they finally got their big break in acting. And I'm like, you, you never know when that chance and opportunity is going to come. You can work towards it, but don't let your age be a factor into why you don't pursue something that you absolutely love to do. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to... Oh. Slide over. oh, no, listen, I, look, I'm going with you. It's a journey. We're, we're going there together. Um, when you were growing up, um, or maybe even now, if you could 
if you had your pick of the Broadway show that you could be on mm -hmm. and the role, what would it be? Like, here I am, Silver Platter, any show that you wanted to be on, what would it be? Honestly? Yeah. <laughs> this is a little embarrassing, but I... Um, <laughs> Uh, it used to be Jerry in An American in Paris. And I say that from, like, the time I was probably, like, I don't know. I'd say, like, eight, eight nine years old. Yeah. But now, um, just because I love the music so much, and this is a guilty pleasure, but I'd want to be Mufasa. Oh, that's great. That's a good one. Okay. I know, but I'm not the typecast for that. So, okay. you know, we, we have to talk about that, is it? You want to talk about typecasting. If I, first of all, if I could sing, um, I feel like I could hold a note, but I can't sing. But if I could sing and someone said, you can be on any Broadway musical, here's the role, do it. I would love, well, there's a couple. I would love to play El Woods on Lee Wong. Okay. <laughs> and bend and snap. And snap, yes, yes. I, I want to do that. I also would want to play Elphaba in Wicked because for mm -hmm. some reason I identify with Elphaba. Like I get it. Like people are like, oh, she's wicked because she's green. And it's like, y'all, she's not really wicked. You just got to get to know her. Uh huh. And then if I could, I would play Effie in Dreamgirls for the first act and then Dina in Dreamgirls for the second act. Now that is not possible, but if it could be. <laughs> It could be in the one man Tony Moore show of Dream Girls Listen, highlighted across I would that. Ten thousand percent do it that way. But like I I I when I was younger, I used to always wish that I, I had the voice to like sing because I love like musical theater and like you know the songs take you through like the emotions of like the characters and the story and all that. And I'm like, oh I wanna be able to tell that. But while in my mind, I feel like I sound like Whitney, in actuality, I don't. <laughs> yep, I, I understand that. <laughs> I totally understand that. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I, I get it, because I've always, like, dreamed of being able to belt my face off, and I've never quite gotten there. And I think, you know, throughout my, like, some of the hardest uh, shows I ever sang were actually smaller shows out in L.A. even. Like, um, mm -hmm. I did this uh, musical called Breakthrough, and the harmonies that we had to sing within the cast is just was wild, and it was, yeah. like, pop music. But um, I've never been able to, like, hold it front and center, belt my face off, and then, you know, curtain down, cool, end it, end the story. <laughs> so, so I get that. I would, like, always wish that I could, are you kidding me, if I could sing? Like Whitney, mm. <laughs> the, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't even, like, I wouldn't even, I would just get to sit here with all the wisdom in the world and be like, mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you so, just open your mouth and it happens. <laughs> no, so I'm just kidding. The amount of training also, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, so I saw that, uh, and of course I, I saw these productions of Peter Pan Live and Hairspray Live, um, yeah. which um, I love the fact that network TV decided to like put these musicals like on TV, but it's, it definitely combines like the art form of television with like the cameras and everything like that with the aspect of live theater. Um, for you, how were those experiences being a part of those productions that combined, you know, TV and theater, which you both uh, have experience in? So I, a, I just want to say that those I was very amped up and excited about both those productions because mm -hmm. of what you said. It's it's sort of crossing that threshold again. Mm -hmm. um, they used to do in the way back in the, the eighties even they they used to try and merge and do movie musicals as or I'm sorry televised musicals as well. Yeah. Um, and I wonder I always wonder why the medium isn't sort of sticking. Yeah. But I know that being a part of the journey was like thrilling in in a way that I. I had had so much theater experience and I had had so much commercial dance television experience at that mm -hmm. point in my, in my life that yeah. when I started on those, on those shows, especially Peter Pan live, um, to be a part of that journey and to see how they were mending like both mediums together mm -hmm. was thrilling, really thrilling. And 
knowing that like it was pretty much a constant tech process the yeah. entire way. Yeah. So um, I would say thrilling is the word that keeps coming to mind because I, although there were moments that I was like, I stopped and pinched myself and was like, wow, you just did a 10 second costume change. You're about to go partner a dude on, on to this like platform that was just built a week ago and we're airing it live in three days. This is so weird. Like, yeah, so I had to keep pinching myself to be like, you're, this is a, this is a, still this dream come true. But then I also was like, it was like being on constant alert like yeah. having coffee in one hand at every moment and just constantly being alert because it was so much, um, there was so many categories all around you. There's the designers that are still finishing touches on the set. And then there's yeah. also the lighting that's setting it while you're still rehearsing, you know, and they, they started us in a studio and then moved on to set. But once you get to set, everybody's trying to get it for that one, one moment, that one final production moment. And uh, it feels like the pressure's on. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you get to that production moment, you sort of, I think just like any one single show you do on Broadway or in a theater or at any moment in your career, yeah. that one moment of where the cameras were live and we were going, yeah. it's just like sort of that same feeling that lifted adrenaline, just racing. And you're kind of, you're, you're ever present, but then you're also like, this is the dream. This is, yeah. the, this is, and it came down to one singular moment where thousands of people are watching. Yeah. But, um, but thrilling is just absolutely the experience I had. Cause I can imagine it's, it's still that feeling of like when you're doing live theater and you know, the curtain goes up and it's that feel of like, you feel the energy of the audience and like, you know, the scenes and you hear the orchestra playing and everything like that. And I, I feel like even with the productions that I've seen on TV, that that feeling was still captured. I mean, you're sitting in your living room, but like, I feel like, you know, everything about theater is still present in a, in a television production. You know, you're still going on this journey with them. You're still telling this story and you're still filling all the fields. So I appreciate it. I wish they would do more of it. I, it's funny, I think about, um, because like just what you said is that in a television experience, um, I think we're conditioned as like a, as an, as like an audience now at this point that because we have the power of the remote and we can yeah. switch it at any moment, it, television becomes expendable really fast. Yeah. You know, and, and almost like social media is right now. We have the power to just boop, bop, boop, bop. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. I think we're, we're, we're hitting a threshold right now in entertainment across all platforms. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about it, you and I could do an Instagram live musical. We could. You know, you would have to do all the singing. But I would say, Tony, and you'd say, yes, let's go on a walk. Where should we walk? No, you're supposed to say, we're quarantined, so we can't go on a walk. <laughs> and then, I'm sorry, we just have to sit here and talk, and then we'll go and dance. And then we'll just sort of like break it down, and we'll do our own live musical. I mean, you know, I'm like, I, I kind of am looking at this, like the scope of things right now. And I'm like, okay, I got to be a part of something that was cutting edge and pushing the boundaries between two mediums. Yeah. And for some reason, they're not sticking. It's like people tune in, but it becomes expenditure, just like art becomes expendable. Yeah. And I think that's something we should actually remember about our art is that it is expendable. And yeah. at some point, we have to start actually focusing on one specific thing to gain value with it. Yeah, and I think I think also our attention span is not where it used to be. I remember growing up, you know, we only had, you know, cable, and you had to watch TV when it happened, and, you know, you were glued to your favorite, like, TGIF, you know, shows and stuff like that. And now, you know, there's binge watching, and there's streaming, and there's, you know, cable, and, like, all this, all this stuff that you can, like, gather entertainment from that I feel like, it's almost like entertainment overload that people are like, if they don't like something within the first minute, they're like, nope. And then they just like keep going to something else. And it's like, sometimes you have to give it a try. You have to, you have to let it warm up before you decide to change the channel. Yep. Yeah. 15 seconds, I think is the, is the, the, the algorithm or whatever. Yeah. Um, someone had a really good question. Oh, this hi, JC. Um, JC wanted to know. Man? Uh, if uh, if you ever want to direct and or choreograph a Broadway show, if so, a remake, reboot, refresh, or an original production? Original. Ooh. 
original. Sorry, it's just like the ideas are always here. They're not. I mean, I I I um, fantasize about being part of a reboot or a remake. Yeah. Um. However, I did like the the ultimate dream inside of my body and my core is like original and yeah. um and as collaborative as it can be with people of their expertise. Yeah. You know, I I don't. I am not a I'm not a huge believer in like all of it coming from one source only because if we only have one perspective we only have one narrative and therefore a story can only be this big. Yeah. And so if you find oh, where's my screen? If you find the balance and 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 collaboration I think is something that I just love and I and I am passionate about. So yeah. I would direct and choreograph or direct and co-choreograph or co-direct and co-choreograph a piece uh an original piece that probably tells uh, a narrative of somebody struggling with um the inner workings of uh always having a dependency on another relationship whatever it is in their life yeah or the independency like a, a moment of self-understanding and self-worth um and you know something that enlightens maybe an audience to start digging a little deeper and doing the work yeah oh do you you may use this quarantine life to go ahead and start developing that because I think we're in need of that now. I think something like that is good for right now. So Instagram Live musical? Listen, I, I'm doing a show on Instagram Live. Why not do a musical? Right. <laughs> we could we could uh, we could just like, set a, a, set a rehearsal time, do a yeah. little one hour like one hour rehearsal. We'll set a little opening number for your piece. Yeah. <laughs> well, did you just see that? Uh, the cast of Cats, uh, the, the touring company, all got on Zoom and did the opening of Cats together. Yes, that's cool. Yeah, so. They're getting creative. Listen, that. let me tell you, people are very creative in this hashtag quarantine life. Like, yep. some, of the, <laughs> some of the art that is coming out of this, I'm like, I don't know where that was before, but now that we all have a chance to sit and like, just be in our creative thoughts, all of this stuff is just coming out and I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm here double tapping on everything. Yes. <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm learning how to ebb and flow with it all. Cause I, um, I, I feel like I have not been uh, as focused or fixated on uh, social media. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not sure what, what the issue is. I don't know if it's because I fell out of love with cell phones a few years back. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to me. Like, I feel like there's some kind of disconnect with, um, trying to stay up to date and consume everybody's life rather yeah. than what's next in my life. What can I do with my, you know? Yeah. So I always try to find that balance um, where I can allow the fix because of the people that I love and I love to in ingest their, their, their stuff. But then there's other moments where I kind of think like, you know, what can I do for myself at this moment? What, what's something that, you know, I can also uh, grow within myself. Yeah. Cause I feel like we are constantly surrounded by multiple universes going on right yeah you know and, and you don't want to miss out like i feel like you're you're someone who's very connected so and social media and things like that are such a distraction now um that you lose the personal connect that you can have with something or someone or thought or an idea um because we're so like you know uh, divulging so much information that we don't get a chance just to sit with ourselves sometimes yeah. 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 That's, all, that's well, a good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. So, Broadway, the dream has come true. Um, what What was that? Well, first, did you originally audition for Spin for for Frozen, or did you go in for something else? I uh, went in for ensemble, just a, an ensemble track that I yeah. think. Um, covered like the poppy role or um I, I think it was poppy um and i was auditioning for that just an ensemble and yeah. i it's interesting i got all the way to the final callbacks um and then i got cut so i oh. kind of had like the whole week uh and if you know about auditioning for shows they love to invest the time in the audition process yeah. so for me i had spent a lot of money i flew myself to new york um, I was in the week long audition and by Friday, I actually had to go back to LA for another job. And I, I, they allowed me to leave early. 
mm -hmm. um, which was really, I was grateful for that. And um, what happened? I remember that morning I got called in to do a side and I read the side and then they're like, cool, we'll let you know, go get that flight. And I got on the flight. And by the time I had landed, they had made all their decisions by the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and then the next day my agent, you know, politely was like, okay, just a heads up. We got unfortunate news, you know, they're not, they're not going to bring you on. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess, um, you know, we'll keep trying for Hamilton. So, yeah. uh, and then, <laughs> um, which was something I actually was going in for at the time. Yeah. And, uh, by Monday I got a call from Hamilton that was like, Hey, we want you to come do a boot camp, which is, um, sort of a week long work study in New York on the yeah. show. And yeah. then they'll send you off if they want to a certain cast, like if they, where they think you might fit within their right. casts. So, um, I actually was like, well, dreams coming true. Hamilton's happening. This is great. And then within hours, I got another email that basically said, um, you know, hey, any interest in auditioning for Sven? And I was like, oh, you mean like the, the, the reindeer? And they're like, yeah. So I sort of had this weird moment of like, all right, do I want to like jump on Hamilton? Or is there now I'm being asked to come back to New York and audition for a role? So yeah. I basically was like, I will, um, you know, take out this audition and I'll ask Hamilton to hold off till I finish the audition process. Um, and they were very gracious. And um, mm -hmm. I went back to New York and uh, I go in the room and it's Michael Curry and there's stilts. And he's like, well, we're just going to learn how to walk on these stilts. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting. I did a little bit of studying from that moment to the audition. I looked up um, animals. I looked up like like reindeer, obviously, um, and I studied my dog. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went back to New York and got on those stilts and pretended like I knew what I was doing, even though I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, great, we think you can do it. So then they flew me to Portland. Uh, they, they offered me Sven, which was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a character on Broadway. And it was like, so what's the intention? And they're like, we don't know. Oh wow! They just were like, you're working with Michael Curry, go. So I actually bit off more than I even knew I was eating because yeah. I'm assuming as, a, as, a, as an actor, yeah, and and a person of physical movement, because then I got to go with and work hand in hand with Michael Curry and his team, mm -hmm. and like they were like, okay, well we're gonna figure out movements for this. We got to figure out like how it coincides with the puppet, how it works, and so I got to be there every step of the way from the prototype, uh, pretty much until they got us, you know, finalized in the rehearsal studio before Denver. Yeah, and. Um, it was the journey of a lifetime. Like I thought that, you know, Hey, I'm going to just go make a Broadway debut. And um, it was such a, a beautiful, humbling experience that gave me the, the encouragement in places that I didn't necessarily see myself as a creative or as a, as a, as a developer of like, you know, concepts. And then yeah. also it sort of put, this little box around the little performer in me that was like ready to do his big jazz routine on center <laughs> stage, you know, in the middle of the stage. And, um, and <laughs> so for that, uh, it's been the wildest journey and like really the coolest character to embody and yeah. to call, you know, to be, to say that I got to, to create um, for live theater because he does exist you yeah. know, in the dream world. I, I will say, uh, you know, I, I got to see you um, in New York when I was there a couple of years ago. Um, I I was working in New York and I snuck away just so I could go see Frozen. And what what I loved about Sven was he's a realized character. Like he's not some hologram or, or some like sort of you know book, 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 book thing, but like you. The way that you move and what you have done to make him as real as possible, I was floored by it. I was like, I suddenly have this love for this reindeer because here he is reacting to everything and moving and blinking and laying down. And I'm like, so like this is more than what I thought. I mean, I was I was there to support you, but just to also see Elsa's uh, dress change, you know, which is my favorite part, but. Suddenly, there was like this this realized reindeer, and I thought, my gosh, like that takes a special skill and a lot for someone to truly embody an animal character because it's not like like the Lion King where 
we still saw the human form of them, but, you know, they were the antelopes that were moving, or, like, you know, the zebra, and things like that. This is an actual, like, thing on stage. Yeah. So I give you so much props and kudos for, for making them you. so real and realistic, and often forgetting that there's a human <laughs> inside there. Thank you. I, I like to call it a magic trick. Yeah. One extremely long magic trick. Um, everyone's like, oh, it's a long plank. And I'm like, kind of. It's like a long magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> You're planking to sustain. But how, um, what do you do to uh, prepare for, because that has to be very taxing on the body to, um, to kind of be hunched over like that the, the entire time and, and all that. Like, what do you do to, to protect yourself and to make sure? Because, listen, we were talking about age. Out of age now, I can't bend and snap like I want to, but, you know. Well, Tony, let's talk about your regimen. <clears throat> if we want to uh, wake up in the morning with a nice stretch routine, you know, open yeah. that side body rib and get your core engaged. And, yeah. Uh, I know I sound crazy, but I honestly, like, I'm getting older myself now, and um, it's things like that kind of regimen where it's, like, even just doing 30 minutes of yoga in the morning to, like, ground your pelvis, root your root your center, a little bit of, like, Pilates work, breath work, stretching, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, those are the kind of things that I'm, like, that keep, that are allowing me to continue, A, doing the role, but then even just preparing for it, which now I'm going to have to do again. Yeah, because woo, daddy's had three weeks off now or four weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to have to get this body together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's been I think what's most important is like um, my education as a young dancer. And this just goes back to say, I don't even know if they're still with us, but somebody was talking about, you know, learning, finding your passion later in life. Yeah. But having that privilege to be able to to be a young dancer and have a good education there taught me the discipline that I needed, just like Whitney would probably wake up and do that vinegar shot and just step into the shower and ah, do everything she needs yeah. just to start her day. You yeah. know, it's like, it's similarly just like that as, as I learned with ballet. Yeah. Um, you just got to do your bar work because the technique then builds a muscle uh -huh. And then the muscle stays with you and, and, and you can flex that muscle when you need it. Or in times of like, there's been times when I've fallen in the suit on stage and I had to protect my own self yeah. physically. Um, and then there's this other half of the role, which I think is the part that made me. Okay. So because this role was my Broadway debut, mm -hmm. I was going to real talk real quick. Yeah. I set the bar really high for myself uh, in that I wanted to be able to speak as a character yeah. just as boldly as the other characters that I was surrounded by. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think what you were expressing and what you might've been feeling was maybe my efforts in that, where I pretty much got into that puppet and said, okay, who am I trying to tell? Who am I trying to trick that I'm a real reindeer? And with, the truth is mm -hmm. it's these young children who come. Because yeah. they, their minds, they don't have the capacity to, you know, to like, they're, they're able to probably figure it out almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I kind of thought, you know, I, we can trick adults to be like, what? That looks like a reindeer. That's, a, you know, because we know the shape of a reindeer, but how it moves, how it breathes, how it responds, mm -hmm. how it even, you know, and I was like, Sven has uh, character traits, characteristics that make Sven, but reindeer have living characteristics that make them alive yeah and there are moments even in the cartoon where sven almost has sort of gangly goofy um trait qualities and um it, i tried to keep those with sven but at very cautiously because michael curry who built the puppet mm -hmm. it started with his deed of an idea and the whole idea was can we trick the human eye to think that this is a real animal yeah. And that's, I think that's where it all stems from. And so for me, stepping into my Broadway debut, I was like, you know what? Like, it's ride or die. Like, yeah. I'm either going to go down in flames or it's going to be something that is like, like the best of my abilities. And I just put 110% effort in. And I'm, I'm really proud of uh, that I did because now I, I have something to look back on and say, like, 
I did that. Yeah. I did that thing. And I still do it. And I still get the chance to, to make kids in, in wonder. Like, just the amount of awes that happen. And I can just hear the reaction of people being like, what uh, 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 is the reindeer? Like, it's part mm-hmm. of the magic of a real Disney show on Broadway. And I'm like, man, this is a dream. This is yeah. a dream come true. No, I mean, kudos to you because it is, I, I was tricked. I mean, even though I knew you were playing the role, I was still like, they made it look so real. And I'm like, so here for it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so take us back to opening night. The dream that you've had since eight is about to happen of you making your debut on on Broadway. Um, by the end of it, how are you feeling? Like, what what was your what was your thoughts? You know, because to to have this dream since you were eight and to finally see it realized, like I'm sure there had to be a sea of emotions that were happening, and the fact that you are originating a character that you literally have seen since its conception, and now at the end, it's like it's all come together. Like, how did you feel? Um, honestly, I was still a little paralyzed from like the adrenaline of like getting through the show, Mm -hmm. but it didn't actually hit me until I remember very specifically walking across the stage, um, putting my jacket on to go to the car to go to opening night, like after that. And I remember stopping on the stage and kind of looking out and I thought, whoa, like, because I can't see the audience from inside the puppet, including you all the way through the bow. Mm-hmm. It was kind of in that moment that I had my own little bow with literally an empty house. Yeah. And I thought it, that's when it hit me that I was just like, wow, that like all of that rush. And I kind of missed it just because I was so focused on doing something so, so specifically and so mm-hmm. accurately. And, um, and then it hit me. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I, this is not at all what I thought it would feel like. Like, yeah, I, you know, this is not at all what that dream. So in a way, I almost felt like I robbed myself of my my own Broadway dream uh, for just a second. And yeah. then and then I'll be honest, throughout the entire first year was when I started to realize that, like, it didn't really matter at the end of the day what I took from it. Mm-hmm. But it's what I was giving. Yeah. And and what I was giving was feeding my own soul. And I didn't even know it. So it actually yeah. took me kind of a year to really oh, absorb the fact that. I got to originate a, a, a character in a Broadway Disney musical, you know, yeah. and, that, and then it hit me and I was like, oh, how awesome. Like, <laughs> how awesome. So now whenever Sven is bowing, I am bowing. Yeah. As Sven, um, I listen for, I, I just, I can hear and feel. And the things that always hit me are the kids in the first two rows. Yeah. Or like, who's in their Sven plushies. <laughs> and then I like start bawling because that's when I get it. That's all oh, I <laughs> performance <laughs> oh yeah it's like uh it's been that kind of journey <laughs> oh i love that um hold on there was a question from jc uh if you could be any other role in frozen broadway which would that be and why i i think i can i can see you in a couple roles but i want to see what you're gonna say well to be honest i would be either the duke of wesselton or i would be <laughs> <laughs> um, or I would be uh, Oaken. Is is that the one that owns the? Uh... <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> person. That I I I thought that was one of my wants for you. Like I could see you in that whole number. Um, oh, what what's the what's the song that they do for that? Uh, oh, who oh, Huga? Yeah, who? <laughs> Oh, I can totally see you. Friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could totally see you doing that and just having so much fun with it. Oh, Chad. Hi. <laughs> There's oh. our old Olaf right there, Chad Burris. Oh, hi. Currently in Mean Girls. Oh, is he? Oh, my God. Mean Girls? I'm so, I'm so bummed because with the whole Corona thing, I think it's thrown off everything. And I was so looking forward to the touring company of Mean Girls because I heard World Burn and I was like totally into it. And I was like, oh my God, I can't, I missed it on my last trip to New York. I was like, I'm going to see it now. But now it's all just, 
All right. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. how was it? How was it for for you all as as everything was unraveling with like Corona and everything like that? Um, what were what was the feel um, with you all as a cast? Like, was there worry? Was there stress? Did you guys think that Broadway was going to end up being closed? Like, what were the thoughts and feelings? Um. I think kind of like everyone else in the world, it, it all unraveled pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, I know for, for like myself and the people that I was surrounded by, you know, I always have these weird instincts. So there was a night, there was Wednesday, it was Wednesday night and the, literally the last night before they actually said Thursday, Broadway is closed, shut down. Yeah. And I couldn't help but have this like gut feeling in my stomach of like, this feels like the last time I'll be doing this for a little bit. Like this yeah. just feels the way. And I couldn't understand why. I think it was because at the same time, our front of house staff was working so diligently to wipe down every seat, to wipe mm -hmm. down all the, like, I think I was just looking at the outpour of extra work going into just maintaining a healthy theater experience. Yeah. That I sort of had this feeling in my gut, like, oh man, this doesn't feel sustainable. Like, mm -hmm. it feels like we're just at the tip of the iceberg and like, there's something coming. Yeah. And so when I got that news the next day, I was devastated. Cause I was like, I, I don't like to, I, I mean, everyone likes to be right. But in that moment, I was so sad that I had that feeling and that it was correct because then I was like, this means big things across every platform. Yeah. And I knew that just because Broadway had gotten hit hard and I sort of had a heads up. My cousin is a lighting designer mm -hmm. um, and he works on bigger tours. So uh, like the, the I, what is it, IEG, like the um, artists uh, that go oh. around, he works with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, like Foo Fighters and Coldplay. And so he, he does their lighting design. And a week earlier, he called me. And it was the strangest thing. It was a week earlier that I thought, nah, we're good. Like, we only, you know, our house seats 1,700 people. Like, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. There's no way. Like, as a Broadway performer, you are in, it is ingrained into you that Broadway doesn't shut down for anything. Right. So I kind of this moment going. of, like, yeah, they're like, nope, Broadway does not close. And I'm yeah. like, okay. And I saw the outpour of, of effort go into the work just to maintain that healthy theater environment. Yeah. But because I had heard my cousin a week earlier say that his schedule cleared out in a day, I was like, oh, uh, something is coming. Something big is coming. And, and, it, and now this feeling is real. And yeah. um, sure enough, Thursday, they said Broadway is shut down for a month. And I was like, okay, I yeah. hear you. I see that. Um, okay, that's a month. And, and not just, I mean, on a technical standpoint, that's a month of, you know, the theater existing and nothing happening in it. So that yeah. breaks my heart. Yeah. But on a whole nother level, I was like, all of, all of those thousands of people who their day was affected by a piece of art, Mm -hmm. No matter what it was, so is it ain't too proud all the way down to Hades Town to like up to Wicked down to it's just like just to think of like that that threshold and then it extended out to touring companies. Yeah, and then literally every so I kind of had this moment of like, wow, it's this virus sucks on so many levels, but on a whole nother level, it is a direct attack on on live art. Yeah, on living, breathing art, things that happen right in front of your face that have been perfected and crafted. And and so I think that we it almost in a way can give us the chance to really take a step back, mm -hmm. kind of breathe into the fact that having that in our lives is a beautiful gift, like yeah. and probably one that we shouldn't take for granted. Yeah, because I, I feel like you, you know, if you're a creative type or just a lover of arts, you thrive off of that, you know, you thrive off of uh, seeing live theater and seeing people perform and seeing people tell a story. And I was even shocked when they were like, oh, Broadway is shut down. I was like, whoa, like, I think that's when it hit me. Like, yeah, things are getting serious. And now we really need to pay attention and we really need to do what we need to do in order to get things back up and running. Because to take Broadway, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, it's, that's a lot. And I know that was that was a, a stab to the heart for for many people to to see that happen. Yeah. Um, what what do you hope coming out of this? Like once hopefully the the dust has settled, 
things are clear, we're slowly going back to normal, uh, Broadway raises its lights again. Uh, what do you hope people um, will, will do once, once we're kind of back to, to normal as far as with, with Broadway and coming back to shows and stuff? Well, I hope that um, a few things, but uh, maybe just two things, but I hope that people will, one, uh, take a moment to really appreciate the moment, the moment that we're in at this, like right now, whether it's, whether you're seeing a show and you're watching the dress change happen, you know, I think taking, taking a, a value to that and, and understanding being like, you know, at what cost am I willing to not have that in my life? Yeah. You know, that thrill of being pushed to my limits in, in real time, in real tempo, mm -hmm. um, and whether it's a happy moment or a sad moment, uh, but the theater has the ability to like let our souls be real for that moment. So I think people, I, I hope that people will come back to the theater and recognize those moments and why we are called to theater. Yeah. And then two, um, I hope that people will also start to maybe look around a little more. Mm -hmm. Um, not to see who's coughing, not to see if somebody's standing six feet away, but rather to see people in their eyes and see who they are. Yeah. And recognize that something that the theater does is it unites people of all shapes and sizes. Yeah. And race and colors and, you know, religious backgrounds. And, and I think that um, we sometimes forget that too because we treat the theater like a television screen where we go in we sit in our one seat oh that person has their hair up or oh gosh who 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 put a six foot two guy in front of me or like yeah. you know we're so affected by what's happening to us but if we maybe do stop and say like oh you know you know that man's willing to slouch in his seat and lean to the left for me or like you know if we actually take a moment to take in the people around us yeah and recognize that we are united by art we yeah. are connected with art. That is the thing that like all of us can always, I mean, you could speak s a different language as I, as I do, but we could still be affected by art either the same way or completely opposite. And that's the cool thing is that we're affected by it. I hope people take a moment to look around and really take, take in who's around them. Yeah. Experiencing the similar things that they're experiencing through art. I agree. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Um, I really hope that this, we hurry up and get through this so that we can see Spin back on the stage and... I wanna see Spin again. I know, so hope, hopefully it will, it will be over sooner than later. And I can't wait for my next trip to New York because I'm coming again, I'm gonna come Good. see the show, I'm gonna come sing Let It Go as loudly or as quietly as I can. Side note, I saw it, I saw the touring company here at the Pantages. It took everything in me not to sing along, but all the kids were. But I was like, I really want to sing too, but I couldn't. So yeah. I may sing quietly when I come see it. <laughs> I think at this point, and I don't know if anyone, I mean, maybe Chad's still on, but I think at this point, we just all have to accept that Frozen is, is a sing along. Yeah. Like the music is just too good. Yeah. And the listen. Too good. You, I mean, even though I don't, I don't think I have a voice, you can't tell me that I don't hit that note and let it go. I feel like in my life and in my spirit, I hit it. Your shower might think so too, I'm sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, <shower head. laughs> the acoustics are great. Um, no. oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Andrew, thank you so much for sitting down and chit-chatting with me. Um, I, of course, uh, adore you and wish you nothing but the best. And I can't wait to see you perform and, and you know, chit-chat again soon. Thank you, Tony. It is It has been great to talk to you. I appreciate your questions. Oh, and I'm course. happy to see your face and share. Huh? I was happy to see your face and share with you. I mean, no. That's why I... That's why I love this because I was like, I'm, if I'm doing this, I want to talk to you. I want to see what your thoughts are. I want to see, I want to take people through this journey. So, and we did it. Mission accomplished. I'm so sorry for the way that I look too. Well, I'm not sorry about it, but you know, no, I'm just saying. Don't, don't be sorry because it, it's so totally obligations fun. these days. <laughs> After a while, it was just normal. Like it, I was just like, he has a ponytail now. This is this is the new me <laughs> <laughs> that you have fully embraced. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Andrew. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Tony. All right, bye. bye. 
Uh, yay! All you musical theater lovers, I hope you guys enjoyed my chat with Andrew Perosi. Uh, what an amazing guy, what a talented guy. When Broadway lights up again, make sure you go and see him in Frozen the Musical on Broadway. Uh, make sure you like him, follow him. All of his information is down at the bottom. Um, and support him, support the arts. Uh, he's much for tuning in to another episode of Tell Me More with me, Tony Moore, and we have another episode coming up in about an hour. Um, so stick around and we'll see you soon. Bye, y'all.